Our next speaker is the president and CEO of the Urban League, a historic civil, civil rights and urban advocacy organization. Uh, Mark Morial, great to see. I should mention one of the most popular mayors of New Orleans. It's great to see you again, Mark. <laughs> Thanks for joining hey, us. Great to be with you. Thank you. And it was great to see uh, Lonnie Bunch and uh, and hear him and his his contributions. Doesn't he have the uh, best job? The he's got the best job. You know, he's the oh, curator. He's got, of he's got a great job. But, you know, he uh, he I remember when he was hired to build the African-American Museum. And, you know, it was a concept. Uh, there was a little bit of money. Uh, they didn't even have a piece of dirt. Uh, so his, uh, you know, his transformative leadership and not to see him at the Smithsonian. I know uh, some of the questions you asked were very important about how to widen this aperture, how the Smithsonian is a vehicle to research and tell the history of all Americans. Uh, so important. Well, appreciate it, Mark, and I appreciate the role you're playing. You know, I have not, you know, only enjoyed conversations with you in the past, but lots of presidents of urban leagues in Chicago and in Los Angeles yeah. and Austin, various places. I'd love for our audience to understand a little bit about the role that um, urban leagues play in in supporting and, and shepherding the interests of particularly black businesses, but urban businesses, civic so, engagement, yeah, but also what a, the problems are right now. So let's, let's, let's paint a picture of the Urban League, which yeah. is unique. We are unique because on one hand, we're an advocacy organization. Uh, we do legislative advocacy. We do civil rights advocacy. On the other hand, uh, we are a direct services enterprise, which means we provide a wide range of direct services to people through our network. You mentioned Los Angeles and Chicago, two cities where we have affiliates. We have a network of 90 affiliates across the nation. So we are doers of, uh, of, of equity. We are, mm. we are implementers of strategies and policies and programs which are designed to address the persistent problems that we face. Uh, and we're a voice. So at the national level, we're a voice on Capitol Hill. We've got a, a robust agenda of legislative initiatives that we are working on that we want to see enacted this year, of course. Uh, and our programmatic work is being responsive to the COVID moment uh, and beyond. So we are unique. I like to use the term sui generis, hmm. uh, unique, one of a kind, incapable of being duplicated. Let me ask you a little bit about the politics of the day. Um, just a couple of days ago, uh, President Biden's team said it was going to prioritize small businesses, you know, much smaller businesses, businesses uh, in communities of color, because they were not getting, you know, the level of um, uh, PPE loans or PPP loans as, as you know, many of the other companies that had out there. Is that working for your constituencies? Did they get, Look, hear the call? Are they lined up? Good question. Are things happening? So President Biden and this National Economic Council led by Brian Deese and uh, others in the administration uh, in announcing what they announced on Monday heard our commentary, heard the issues that we raised over the last several months about why the original PPP programs were bypassing small businesses and black owned businesses and owner operated businesses. Mm. And so we pointed out some significant deficiencies in the design of the original PPP, which had great intent, but its design was flawed in so far of its ability, its ability to be able to address the needs of small businesses and the needs of African American businesses. So the changes he's made uh, in effect place a focus on businesses with less than 10 employees. 90% of black businesses have one employee. Uh, the changes that he made will create an opportunity for minority depository institutions, black banks uh, and Hispanic banks uh, and banks owned by people of color and community development lenders to play a more significant role in determining who gets a forgivable PPP loan. So these changes, these priorities uh, by President Biden are welcome, uh, needed, uh, and necessary. And I appreciate, most importantly, the way in which his team engaged with not only the National Urban League, but a number of advocates of minority businesses, Black-owned businesses, small businesses, 
to recalibrate this program. Uh, what I am certainly hopeful for is that is it is the beginning of a, a larger commitment, a more significant commitment by the national government to stand up and provide better, better capital access flows to uh, small businesses, black-owned businesses, and other minority businesses. Well, I want to ask you a question. I'm probably going to get in trouble for this because I'm not sure I can frame it right, but, you know, why not do it on, on a show with everybody listening? But, you know, I'm wondering if we run a mistake in, like, oftentimes we, you know, talk to, to, to business and say, hey, one of the big issues right now is minimum wage and this affects the black community and others and you need to get that up to $15 or $11 or something. But, you know, when I look at the kind of broader questions of economic empowerment, You've got a lot of dynamic business owners and business leaders out there that may not get the capital they want. They're running different. I know these two women who run a, 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 a company outside of D.C. called Furlough Cheesecake. And they, they created this when they were furloughed from government service. And now they're down at National Harbor. They're doing really, really well. They're innovative. I'm just wondering, you know, you have a wide aperture when we talk about business engagement and empowerment. And it's not just about minimum wage. I know minimum wage is part of the story. But do you think we're making a mistake of typecasting just in that area? Do we need to broaden our discussion about what economic engagement means? There's no means? question it needs to be broadened. But minimum wage is one thing that is in the absolute control of public policy. Hmm. The minimum wage is set by the Congress. Uh, the notion of a national minimum wage has been present since the 1930s, I believe. Uh, the notion that mm. Americans who work ought to be able to make a wage that is dignified and decent. Mm. But you are so right that that alone is not going to solve the racial income or the racial wealth gap. But here's what's important. Most of the people, a large percentage, I should say, of people who earn or have minimum wage jobs. Uh, they are women under the age of 40, many raising children. So we've got to understand the human element, not just the economic theory, not just sort of these arguments about uh, whether it's burdensome. And then we ought to be aware of the reality. Look, almost half the states, about half the states, they haven't waited for the federal government to adjust their minimum wage. We have right. minimum wage levels higher than the national minimum wage, I think it's some 25 states. Yeah. But that's not the best way to do economic policy, Got to have it. this patchwork of minimum wage rules and laws all across the nation. What we've said uh, historically is let's right. be consistent and set a basic floor. And I think we need to be talking in terms of not a minimum wage, but a living wage. Uh, and for people to earn more yeah. money is also a stimulus to the economy. It's a stimulus right. because most of the money that folks earn uh, who make uh, a minimum wage or who make lower wages, they're going to spend that on food, clothing, right. shelter. Uh, they're going to they're going to plow it back into the economy. Right. And that's going to have a positive effect on economic yeah. growth. So uh, but the premise of your question, is it enough? It is not enough, but it's something that Congress can absolutely control. Thank you for that, my friend. We're out of time. Barbara Lee's coming, but I got to squeeze in one last thing. So give me a fast yeah. frame. You, I love your tweets, and you're tweeting about the International Civil Rights Center and going to this, uh, you know, the the site of the February 1, 1960 whites only lunch counter in Greensboro, Greensboro North Carolina. I want to know how did that feel? What should people who are not familiar with that experience, you know, just give us a sense of that moment. And because you tweeted about it, found it very powerful, but real short form because we got to move to Congress. You know, I went to the site of the new museum about uh, two years ago and, and the longtime director, Amelia Parker, just passed uh, at that site. But but, you know, I think if people can imagine the indignity of having money in your pocket and not being able to eat at a lunch counter in a five and dime store is what mm. Woolworth was called in the day and how that makes people feel. As a boy, I'll say, a uh, little boy, we would go to Sears. And when we'd go to Sears store with my mother, uh, we would never, she would never allow us to use the segregated bathroom hmm. at Sears store. She'd say, we're not using this bathroom. You have to hold it till we get home. Because they were not going to bow to the indignity of segregation. 
Well, Mark Morial, President and CEO of Urban League, former mayor of New Orleans, good friend. Thank you so much for sharing your hey, thoughts with us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Continue to do what you're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you, you. Mark.